Alpha episode. This is episode 141, and we have a very special guest. His name is John Rubino. And John is the COO and founder and co-managing partner of JID Investments LLC, or JIDI. <laughs> <laughs> is a real estate private money and equity investment firm which seeks to secure high yield returns with medium risk by providing investment capital to individuals and businesses with viable resident residential commercial and mixed use real estate business and or investment opportunities so john's primary responsibilities include executing the daily operations of GID investments to include marketing and advertisement, website and social media design, investor and client relations, extensive due diligence review of, of all the prospective investor and business clients, financial and revenue analysis, and securing of investment source to project funding resulting in investment of over $21.25 million. Uh, dollars uh, with revenue growth, growth exceeding $15.9 uh, million dollars actual and projected for the company. And of course, for more information, there is a website called GIDinvestments.com uh, GID and you can get in contact with John on a personal level, which of course is through the Facebook, LinkedIn, and the YouTube channel, of course, is going to be included in the show notes down below. So John, uh, just want to say a big thank you for joining me today on this episode. Thanks, Marty. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. That's no problem. It's my pleasure. Happy that we <laughs> finally connected and we can talk some business. Absolutely. So, you did a good job reading my bio in one breath there. <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah, I'm trying. Like, I got used to it. You know, I can hold yeah. my breath for quite a long time right now doing all these episodes. Good, good job. Good job. Thank you. But uh, again, very specific numbers, 21.25 million dollars, which, you know, we don't get, uh, you know, into these very kind of specific numbers with a lot of people. So that's good. You like the specifics and you all about the details. So that's a good sign. So again, talking from a personal kind of perspective, and maybe you can take us back to the the stages and the beginning stages of your kind of personal real estate business career and how did it happen for you? Sure. Well, uh, I served 20 years in the Navy after graduating from college in 1997. Uh, I was a pilot in, in the Navy and some of my aircraft behind us here on the wall. And uh, that was my first dream job. I got the chance to fly aircraft for, uh, for the Navy. It was a blast. Uh, back in 2004, 2005 timeframe, about halfway point in my Navy career, I started to get interested in real estate through some friends that were uh, stationed with me at the time, who were both pilots with me, stationed at the same location there. And we started, you know, dabbling in real estate. We started looking at renovation properties. We started looking at new construction, foreclosures. So we just started to kind of get immersed in, uh, in learning more about real estate. And uh, one of my friends actually had a, a lot of success. And at the 10 year point there, uh, I was getting ready to take orders overseas with my family to, uh, to Italy. And, uh, and he was going to stick around at the time in Maryland and in Washington, D.C. and start his business uh, coming out of the Navy and doing that full time. So I kind of said to him, hey, you know, you helped me grow and you've helped me in real estate and I want to continue to stay in real estate. But obviously being overseas, I can't be active. I can't go out and buy property. I can't go out and do this full time. So I said, I'd like to invest with you passively. So I gave him uh, a chunk of money and we had an agreement that he would give me a fixed return uh, for as long as I left the money with him. So Fast forward seven years later, and I was making 10% a year on my principal and collecting the, uh, the 10%, which was great. I learned a ton about real estate during that period. I was getting uh, project proposals he was putting together to, to purchase, to develop, to renovate, and to put on the market for sale. And I was part of that. So I was getting a chance to do a lot of the research, the analysis, the due diligence, the market summaries and, and really understanding the business more from the passive side and understanding what he does in his day-to-day -day operations because he still had to be successful. He still had to make sure he could you know, carry the projects, operate them uh, efficiently and ideally to get to his designated or his ideal exit strategy for the projects. So I learned quite a bit you know, over that seven-year period. And when I moved back to the DC area after a short uh, tour down in Texas as an instructor pilot, I was stationed right out of the Pentagon and I knew that I was going to be getting out of the Navy. I was going to be retiring. 
in about a five year period. This was back in 2011. So in 2012, 2013, I sat down with some of my financial advisors and people that were in my network and said, you know, I, I'd love to take what I did for seven years with my buddy and his company. And I'd love to bring that to other, you know, businesses that need capital, that need equity, that need private money for their companies and projects. And I'd love to be able to have people that are friends and family, associates, colleagues that I know that would want to come in with me and invest to bring in larger sums of capital. And that was when the kind of idea of this business took off. The, the, uh, the dream of JID Investments really took off. I partnered with my CPA, who's now my CFO, our company CFO, and, and it's he and I that manage the company and operate the company full time. And over the last eight years plus, we've gone out and invested on 22 projects. We've completed 16 successfully. We've earned our investors anywhere between 15 to 20% a year on their, on their money, sometimes over 20%. And we brought a diversified portfolio of different types of assets to our investors to potentially invest in. So we started small. We were doing renovation properties, residential renovation, single family homes. We were bringing in anywhere from one hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars a project, and we kind of, you know, we just kind of cut our teeth into the business. And uh, after that, we started bringing on people that liked what we did from the investment side, uh, friends and family. Again, uh, my partner David owns an accounting firm down in Hilton Head, so he brought in some of his close friends and clients. And fast forward to 2020, since we've been in business since April of 2013, and we have 151 investors. We work with about a half a dozen sponsors that uh, utilize our capital. And um, we've had some great success. We have a great track record. And you know, a lot of that was pre-COVID, pre-recession for the United States here. But given the fact that what we do and, and how we go through each of the people we want to work with and the deals that they bring to us, we do a very good job at the analysis, the due diligence to make sure that the sponsors that need our money are a good fit, that we can add value to them, and that they have projects that we think and know are going to be attractive to our investor base. Mm. Okay. So that's kind of condensed story. Of, yeah. Uh, of GI. Very condensed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I mean, but there are some great statistics that you mentioned. Again, the facts, you know, 151 investors, 22 projects, 20 plus, you know, percent return over a year for investors. So there's like quite good numbers, you know, for the people who are listening and it sounds appealing to them. But still, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, when you have these conversations with the people about real estate investing, and I'm sure they have plenty of questions that, of course, uh, I'm, I'm probably not will be able to ask you because of the time that is given. But what is the main topics that you talk with the potential investors that they look into invest in real estate? What is the like most common questions that they people ask? Well, the most important thing you have to do as a business is identify the problem and what you bring to the table to help solve that problem, right? And so for us, the problem we see with sponsors is that uh, they're limited at times on the amount of capital that they want to devote to a single property. So our, our company invests on a deal by deal basis. We're not a fund. We don't bring in a pot of money and then we decide where it goes. Each of our projects are a specific opportunity that we bring forward and that our investors who are on board have joined us, have filled out the paperwork and are in a position to see our projects, have the opportunity to see those deals that we approve for funding. So by becoming an investor with us, uh, there's no obligation or commitment to invest on a project. It just allows us to send project sensitive and confidential information that we get from our sponsors when we do have a project that's ready for investment to look at. The second thing you got to do is you got to educate. You got to educate people and not to speak down to people by any means, but you have to be able to uh, allow them or share with them or convey what you do. Right. And you have to kind of do that in a way that, you know, they hopefully can can understand. And some folks are very basic investors have never invested in real estate before. Some are very, very uh, experienced, have done it numerous times. And the most important thing my, I want to do is educate them in a way that they can go and find things on our website, on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook page, on our LinkedIn page, on our social media handles and learn about us 
at their pace. They can go on my website. They can bring up all my key documents. They can review all of those on their own at their own time. And then if they want to, and I appreciate it, I love it actually, is I love scheduling meetings and sitting down either on a Zoom or if someone's in the local area or they want to fly in to meet with me to go see my projects or sit down and have a cup of coffee or lunch and learn more about what we're doing. It's very important, obviously, to have that face-to-face -face interaction. That's what we want to do. We want to have that. But there are people that see what we do on our website. They see what we do on our uh, information management or, or marketing and advertising and say, you know, this is great. We like what these guys do. We're very transparent. We open up the books and show everybody what we've done and, and what's on the in the pipeline. And uh, that way they understand it. And we want to walk them through so that everything is done on the front end. And when they become an investor, they're now kind of in ready mode to start looking at active deals. We don't go out and raise money when we have a project. We already have investors that are on board that know our process, that have seen our documents, have reviewed a private placement memorandum, understand how we go about putting a project together. We like to do that up front, Marty. So that way they're comfortable with us. They know what they're going to get. And then they get to see a project when it's time for, uh, for them to look at one. Got it. So talking about the project specifically, what do you currently have? Because uh, again, we, like I, when I read through the bio, you kind of have a little bit diversified yeah. approach in investments. So can you talk about the investments and some differences on those investments when it comes to investing passively? Yeah. So, you know, most, most importantly, we're, we're a passive real estate vehicle for, for folks that want to uh, invest passively and that want to invest at a, a entry point or a level of capital that's not overwhelming. Uh, we typically will raise a minimum investment uh, per investor at about twenty-five dollars to $50,000 in investment. And together, we combine that with those monies and we try to bring anywhere from a half a million dollars to $5 million a project for our developers. So if uh, we're going out and raising $3 million of equity for one of our sponsors, uh, we'll go out and raise you know, 100 units of investment at $30,000 a piece. David, my partner, and I will take one or two units each to have skin in the game. And then we'll also go out to our investors at that point and we'll advertise the remaining units for those folks that want to participate. Um, typically, the asset classes that we're, we're in is um, we're diversified. Like you said, we want to be considered an alternative investment uh, company that folks can see multifamily development multifamily stabilized hold, residential, commercial, mixed use, student housing, senior assisted living, residential renovation. We still like to do residential renovation, uh, opportunity zone. So those are the different types of asset classes. And we have that on our website. If, in, if folks go on our website and click on our investment services page, they'll actually see the asset classes that we invest in. And the nice part about us too, is that folks can invest with capital that they have saved sitting in the bank account. They can do it with a trust. They can do it with a self-directed IRA. They can stand up a partnership, an LLC. Uh, on Opportunity Zone investments, they can uh, invest deferred gains capital to an Opportunity Zone investment. So that's really important for us. And for us, you know, we feel the best markets right now are in the markets we're investing in. I live in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. I'm in Northern Virginia. We love D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, but we like North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Tennessee. That's kind of our backyard. And the reason why we did that uh, is because they're very strong, fiscally conservative. Uh, cost of living is very good. Populations are increasing. Uh, the job market's just surging, even in these times with COVID. And um, the absorption rate, given what's going on with COVID, has been uh, very strong. So we're very happy to be in those markets. Of course, our portfolio has taken a little bit of a hit with COVID, but we have still are resilient and we're still doing very well. And we're still within 1% to 3% of our projected returns in that 15 to 20% range on our our large scale projects, but we're also investing in multifamily. We, we have a multifamily residential asset that we're investing in, paying out cash flow. Uh, we're in uh, commercial development, residential development and construction. Uh, we're in an opportunity zone investment in Washington, DC. We're looking at a senior assisted living project down in Florida. Uh, so we're looking at an array of different projects. It's not really uh, the projects that we're focused on solely. It's very important, of course, but the real big thing is the sponsor. How good is the sponsor? How good are they at what they do? 
How experienced are they? Where are the locations? How have they done in the past? What's their assets under management? These are, these are the specific things I look at because what I'm doing is I'm making sure that the sponsor's solid, the projects are solid, and then I finally take the last question, my partner and I look at each other and say, are you going to invest in it? And if he nods and said yes, and I say, I'm going to invest in it, then it goes to the investors. And then the investors get to beat the heck out of us and ask us all their questions before they have to ever commit. So that's typically how we do it. Okay, so coming back again to the diversified portfolio approach, like, uh, and let's imagine it's a, it's kind of a pie chart mm -hmm. and there's all these different assets. So what will be kind of the biggest piece on, on the chart that people are now looking forward to invest in? Yeah, for us, we've been, our sweet spot is development, new construction, let's say condos, apartments, townhouses. And the reason why is because uh, they have uh, the highest yield return. That's where we're making that 15 to 20%. Uh, our investors like making those higher returns. They're willing to take on a little more risk. They're willing to uh, wait a little longer for those projects to finish. And um, again, being in that kind of lower tier entry point, which we feel is very uh, manageable for new investors that are coming in and want to invest with us, uh, we feel that uh, we're competitive and um, offer a, a service to our investors that allows them to participate in projects where they wouldn't be able to do it on their own or, or, you know, cut checks on their own of that size for the total investment. Mm -hmm. Got it. So we kind of talked about a little bit about vetting sponsors and making sure that you provide the right investment vehicles for the people that come in and they're looking to invest in, in, in the deals mm -hmm. that will provide them the, the highest yield and the best possible options, you know, with the best like equity multiples, IRRs in place. Mm -hmm. But like, what, what is the thing that goes right now and a lot of operators kind of struggling with, well, I'm sure maybe in your case is, is different and that's what I want to talk. That's what I want you to talk about that is the rent collections. I, I mean, can you talk about like, how did you go about before the COVID and during the COVID right now, how do you talk with those, uh, you know, sponsors about, you know, rent collections and how close you are to, to the day to day, like operations for those people and making sure that the investment investor capital is secured. Yeah. So, I mean, once an investor comes in on a deal and we engage and we actually invest in a project, we're actively working with the sponsors weekly, daily, uh, quarterly to get, you know, the information just to keep uh, on top of what the projects are doing. Uh, at a minimum, I send out a quarterly update from our sponsors on our larger projects that are a little longer in the timeline, you know, a very formal report that's got, you know, the, the costs that were projected and the timelines and then any updates due to delays due to COVID or uh, due to weather or due to just, you know, the county uh, waiting to issue permits. So th that's probably how we stay on top of projects. And again, we make ourselves available anytime. So if, uh, if an investor wants to come visit and they're out of town, we'll, we'll pick them up at the airport, we'll take them out to a project site, we'll let them walk the project. They have access to us 24 seven anytime. That's my job, I do this full time now. And um, you know, we, we are actively engaged. We put together project journals. I have you know hundreds of pages worth of, of documentation on each project so that I can go back and I can study up on, you know, what this communication said this month and now this month. So that way, I'm not trying to challenge the sponsors, but I just want to make sure we're on the same page. You know, we look at it as a team effort. We want everybody to be successful. We want the sponsors to be successful. We want to be successful. We want our investors to be successful. We want our investors to feel that they can ask us any questions they want. First and foremost, it's their money. First and foremost, it's their interests, and they have to feel comfortable with us. And any investor that I have knows that whenever they call us and they want to ask us questions, they, they want updates that uh, were available. But the big thing is just staying engaged with the sponsor and their teams, not the analyst at the lowest level of the business, but the president, the CEO, the COO, the CFO, the executives that I could reach out to at any given time and say, hey, have a couple quick questions or, hey, I read an article today in, uh, in the news that uh, this is coming uh, an impact that could impact our project. You know, what are you guys seeing? And, you know, I'm, I'm very much active with those folks to make sure that they're giving us what we need and making sure our investors are comfortable. Got it, got it, good. So talking about the future, again, coming back to the current portfolio and like diversified, being diversified, are you planning to even branch out to a different options? You know, because like I came across a few people, actually more than a few people who talked about, you know, senior kind of house developments, you know, and 
you know, mobile home parks, you know, and uh, storage units. So are you looking to branch out to these or are you going to continue to do what you're currently you know, working on? Well, the nice part now, Marty, is that we get sponsors that come to us through referrals or they're finding us. We're not going out actively and looking for folks. I have more projects than I can fund, which is a good problem to have. Yeah. And um, I, I like that because, you know, whenever you get introductions from referrals it's always a warm handoff it's not like you know i found this person on google or mm -hmm. whatever and and i don't know them and i gotta you know basically start the process from scratch we we, we get introduced to these folks so there's that warm handoff that we like um again i'll, I'll go back we've looked at storage projects we've looked at i have a, a good friend in the navy who's retired who's managing a mobile home park out in cleveland ohio that you know has approached me and we're com we're talking about how we could help them so again, it's not necessarily going after certain asset classes. It's really what sponsors are approaching us who are doing these projects for a living have done multiple asset classes in that area and uh, see that we can help them and bring value to them. You know, we do look at markets and, you know, if I'm looking at an asset class, let's say student housing, and there's not a university within a 50 mile radius of where these folks want to do that project. And yeah, of course I'm going to, you know, say, you nah, know, this may not make sense. Not because, you know, there, there's opportunity there, but there's nothing there right now. And, you know, how is that going to impact if I have a uh, low demand for a product and then why are we bringing it to that market? What makes it unique? What's going to absorb it once it gets put up. So, um, you know, in our areas that we're in, commercial and re and residential de development is still very, uh, very popular in Washington, DC and in Virginia and Maryland, um, you know, down South, we see multifamily residential, we see um, um, a development for new apartment complexes as being something new now where a lot of our developers who are in the condo development for sale are now getting into the apartment development for hold which is a nice model because, you know, you come in, you can invest on the purchase of the land, just like a condo for sale. You can invest in the construction phase, which is the same for a condo for sale. And then when you get to disposition, which is usually going to be the sale of the condos in a condo project with an apartment complex, you're now refinancing out. So you're recap, you're refinancing or recapitalizing all of the investment monies out with all of the profits. And now you're transitioning into a stabilized asset, which we would then have the opportunity to come in as a separate investment, which now yields cash flow for investors that want to be involved in that type of asset class. So you kind of have like a continuum of investment. You're, an inv you're investing in development, construction, disposition, you get your capital back and your profits, and then you have the opportunity to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to leave 25% of my money or 40% of my money in the project, and I'm going to get you know a 7 or 8% coupon or go out in the mail every quarter and get my check that's a nice opportunity to have yeah so is there any other advantages that are you know associated with passive investing you know besides getting that monthly you know passive income check oh yeah absolutely i mean as a passive investor the big thing is you're not taking on any of the bank liability especially if there's recourse so you know these developers we work with that's the biggest thing they're taking on is that recourse debt that 50 to 75 percent leveraged capital that's coming from debt mm -hmm. and they're going to be on the hook personally if god forbid something happens the worst thing that's going to happen to me and it's never happened and i'm not going on wood right now is we haven't lost any money we haven't lost any money in any of our deals our worst deal we still made an 8% return for our investors. It took a little longer, but we, we made that return. But we haven't lost any money. We pay a preferred return to our investors before our company takes any profits. So we try to do everything we can to protect their, their, uh, their capital. That's the worst thing that could happen to us is we lose money. The worst thing that can happen to the sponsors is they lose the property. They, they basically have to recapitalize what they owe. And then if the number's still negative, the bank can go after them personally. So that's one huge advantage of as a passive investor. The other advantages are, you know, you're not actively managing the project. You're not out there dealing with the county. You're not out there trying to get permits. You're not out there trying to get entitlements. You're not out there dealing with the general contractor. You're not dealing with your schedules. These are all the things we have oversight on. And we're part of that, you know, mindset that's going on with the development of the project. But we're not personally responsible for that. That's, that's all on the sponsor. The disadvantages really are kind of, hand in hand to that is that, you know, you don't have control. You're not 
the general partner. You're not the sponsor, right? You're, you're kind of a limited partner, money partner, and you don't have any major decision-making powers. So if you come in and the project was going to be condo development, and let's say the market shifted now and the developer turns around and says, you know what, I got to do it as a, a, an apartment development. You're kind of in that mix and you just have to see, okay, how does that now impact my exit? How does that now impact my money and my returns? So that's kind of the big thing that uh, are the differences on the responsibilities and the pros and cons of being a passive investor. But it's nice yeah. going to your computer on a Saturday with your cup of coffee and pulling up your portfolio and seeing that, you know, everything's doing well. And it's nice to call me up and say, hey, John, can we meet out in D.C.? I want to take a look at the project we're in. Or, hey, John, I'm flying in from California. I'd love to meet you for lunch and go look at the project. Yeah, that, that's great. We love to do that. And I think for like, first of all, these people, they chose to invest passively I, again, because I don't think they want to make any decisions you know, yeah. except, except if it's, you know, if I'm going to pull the money out, like what, what right. I'm going to invest next, like those right. type of decisions, you know, personally. So, but talking about some advantages, is there, you know, uh, like if you're investing passively, do you get still the appreciation and depreciation, like tax write-off is, is, is those things working as well? It just depends on the asset class. If we're doing a multifamily residential hold or there's a property that's being developed that's going to eventually have some sort of stabilized asset that's going to be staying inside that portfolio. Yes, we do. We do have depreciation write-offs. Um, and you know, when it comes to the taxes and it comes to K-1 statements and all of the um, the financials from an investment relations standpoint, we handle that as well. All of our projects, David is a, an enrolled agent, which is a federally licensed CPA. So he does all the tax returns. He does our investor statements. So, you know, everything that you invest on with us, you're going to get tax paperwork from us, which is nice. You're going to get the depreciation write-offs included in those tax returns if it's applicable. So yes, we do. Uh, we do have some of that on occasion, just depends on the asset. Awesome, awesome. And that's, of course, for the 0.003% of the fee. <laughs> it just so, depends. Yeah, yeah it just depends. So, so talking about, again, the, the way you underwrite the deal, well, of course, the, the deal sponsors, the way they underwrite the deals and the way you look at those deals, like, again, because you're a little bit diversified, so it's construction, you know, development and multifamily and, you know, mixed use kind of property. So what, are, what is the way that people can invest? Is this like traditional syndication approach? Can, can people invest you like, 401 case and, you know, Roth Airways, is that available as well? Yeah. So like I said, if you go on our website and you pull up the investment services page, we have about six options on what you can utilize in order to invest with us. Self-directed is pretty popular. Trusts, um, you know, uh, forming, a, and we have eight doctors that have invested with us as a partnership and limited liability corporation that they've invested, pulled their money in. And, you know, the LLC will get a K-1 when we liquidate and then they can go to their accountants and their accountants can do each individual K-1 for their specific members. Um, but yeah, we have, and we have great people in the industry here in the States that we work with that uh, they don't, they don't compensate us. They're just so great at what they do and we appreciate their services. We refer them business quite a bit. I have a gentleman out in Arizona that does self-directed. Um, so there's definitely resources we have available and that people can utilize in order to uh, invest with us in a variety of different ways. That is awesome. Good. So personally, for your own personal business, uh, I mean, talking about GID investments, like where do you want to take the business? Because again, we're kind of in very uncertain times, but I mean, you're still making things happen and you have a lot of people coming to you, presenting the deals and you, you're vetting those uh, potential sponsors that you want to work with. But from a business standpoint, what are you planning to accomplish for yourself personally this year? Yeah, well, this is a pretty big year for us. I mean, obviously we're getting through one of the roughest years probably in the last, you know, God knows how many years with, with COVID, you know, maybe the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're just, you know, we want to, we have about $14.5 million in active investments right now that we're investing on at about six projects. And one of the, uh, and the largest of that is getting, is liquidating. We actually sent out our first distribution check uh, on, uh, on liquidating that property. So that's obviously very important to us right now is making sure that uh, the projects that are in the profile are, are moving towards those liquidation periods, given the extensions and the challenges with COVID. Um, second is really scaling the business. We are ready to scale. We are growing kind of uh, vertically and we need to start matching that horizontally. So we are looking at uh, bringing on people 
with capabilities that can help us from a resource standpoint. Uh, we're looking at systems. We actually are looking at uh, bringing on an investor portal this next quarter, first quarter of 2021. We want to bring on an investor portal to, to help uh, make our process more efficient, help save us time, and to utilize as kind of at the central focal point so that investors can go on, they can log on, they can see everything they're doing. Uh, we can send emails in the snap of a finger on a CRM. So we're, we're very much interested in bringing on uh, an investor portal. And then, yeah, just bringing in the right people, bringing in the right people that can manage the portal that help us with due diligence, that uh, can be project management consultants to go out and help us uh, find new sponsors, take our system and our process and introduce it to them and, and see you know if they're a good fit and kind of doing that more on a, a larger volume or scale. Um, we like the current pace we're at. We like uh, the fact that uh, we have the systems in place. I didn't get into it too much, but again, we, we are compliant. We, we file uh, usually Form D506, uh, B or C through our uh, corporate securities attorney that does our private placement. So we're, we're by the book. Uh, we are non-brokers, but again, you know, we don't look at this as uh, any type of, of uh, program that uh, we're, we're advising people or broker dealers. We are purely uh, a company that raises capital together with our money and we bring it into the deals under a limited partnership under that Form D506. So everything is done by the book. And, um, you know, it's definitely good. I highly recommend anybody that's doing this type of business to make sure you have a business and a corporate securities attorney because they're very important people and you need to make sure that you're doing this by the law. Compliance is huge. And, and in our country, the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission, you know, they, they, are, uh, they do what they're supposed to do and we respect that. So we make sure that we follow their guidelines and their, their rules and their regulations to the T. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Awesome, awesome. So, I mean, a lot of great things are happening for you personally and for the business yeah. and for the investors and what's currently happening with the deals. But all, all of that set aside, because uh, I always ask uh, people, you know, that kind of question. It's a, you know, it's the last question that I want to ask you is sure. about your, your kind of personal approach when it comes to the business and you're going about, you know, providing all these people that are watching, again, accredited, you know, investing through, you know, the, you know, self-directed IRAs and all these and, this, and providing these great investment vehicles for those people instead of giving the money to the Wall Street or all of these kind of, you know, old school type of, you know, investment vehicles. So that's awesome. And you being on a podcast, you know, sharing your message. But the question that I wanted to ask you, is there a legacy piece that you want to leave behind the business also? Well, you know, listen, I, I look at this as a gift. I, I've been blessed so much in my life. Uh, my first career in the Navy, a family I have, um, everything I have is by the grace of God. And I stand by that. I wake up every day and say that my foundation is built on my faith. And I really believe that. And I try to live my faith out every day. Um, and I feel like in this business, you get to meet so many wonderful people and have the experiences of learning from new people. I, I don't ever try to pretend that I know everything because I don't. I just love the opportunity to be in front of different people each day and learn from them and, and share with them and get to know them on a personal level. And I feel that's exactly the blessing that God's given me. My legacy is really just to um, enjoy what I'm doing. Take take life for what it is right now and 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 you know make it to the best that I can and and, um, and, and bring people on that are investors or sponsors I can help and, um, and really just take, you know, that seven years, you know, it's, it's interesting. And I'm just thinking of it now, you know, seven is a very holy number, number in the Bible. And, you know, I think that's one of the messages God gave me is, you know, Hey, I gave you seven years of, of, of feast and, and blessing and take this and share it with as many as you can. And I guess that's what I'm doing. So I guess my legacy is just to be remembered as someone that, you know, was a good person that did things uh, with integrity and, and, and respect and was honest, was transparent and just treated people as best as he could. I can't control what happens in the market. I can't control what happens. Uh, try my best to stay on top of it and we mitigate and try to alleviate the risk as best as possible. But, you know, we just do what we can and, and be honest with folks. And if we can do that and, and, and be successful and have fun and meet wonderful people and make a little bit of money, then life is good. Yeah, definitely. And that's a great mission to have. So again, uh, guys and girls, one thing that I wanted to ask you before we're going to go, if you shared this episode with a friend of yours, 
The best case scenario with that friend who always talks about investing in real estate, but want to handle the headaches of, you know, the three T's, the tenants, the toilets and termites, <laughs> make sure to, to pass this episode along because he or she will find out about investing in different assets, you know, like uh, residential, commercial, mixed use and, you know, uh, development. And that's available again through what John is currently offering. So make sure and go and check it out. The website that's called uh, GI gidinvestments.com and uh, you can get in contact with john and i should recommend to get in contact with john personally on facebook and linkedin and there's a youtube channel for you to learn more about what john and and, the, and his company is working on but for you personally john i just want to say a big thank you again for being today on this episode and providing all this value the knowledge the tips the strategies on on investing in real estate so i appreciate it Thanks, Mark. It's my pleasure, and um, I'm glad to be here with your listeners. And if anybody has any questions, anything regarding real estate or just, you know, hey, I'm getting started or I'm thinking about uh, getting into it, investing, reach out anytime. Like you said, our website, jidinvestments.com, LinkedIn, YouTube. Um, happy to talk to folks anytime. I love doing that. And always, always happy to help. Awesome. Awesome. So again, guys, last time, make sure to pass this episode along. And as always, I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Thanks, Mike.